Let's turn to the message for this morning. We are in the first part of a four-part series entitled, Who is in Control? That's an important question, wouldn't you agree? Because people like to be in control or know who is in control. Lorelai Gilmore said the following, As long as everything is exactly the way I want it, I'm totally flexible. As men, would you agree we like to be in control? How many men out there like, guys, it's not sinful. I mean, it's, it's okay to say, yeah, actually, yeah, there's something in me that likes to <laughs> be in control of what's going on. But men, are we really in control? Because according to Grucho Marx, man does not control his own fate. The women in his life do that for him. So your sister, your uh, mom, hey, your mom-in-law, and oh boy, your wife, they're probably determining quite a bit of what's going on in your life, hey? More seriously, some argue that our desire for control is actually a source of all kinds of problems in our lives. Steve Maraboli said, the reason many people in our society are miserable, sick, and highly stressed is because of an unhealthy attachment to things they have no control over. This morning, I pray and hope that God will give us the right perspective as to who is really in control. And the four topics, just to remind us as we go through the series, today we are looking at creation, then we'll be looking at suffering the following week, authorities, and we'll end with the future. As we look at creation, we have three headings. Firstly, God created the universe. Secondly, not only did he create the universe, but he continues to control the universe. And finally, what about this issue of evolution? Let's begin with the first one. God created the universe. As has already been stated by Jason, the very first verse of the Bible, Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. The authors of um, the ESV study Bible, the guys who put the notes that help us understand scriptures better, they say that heavens and earth in this very first verse of scripture actually refers to everything. God created everything in the universe. And they go on to say that in the beginning refers to the beginning of everything. And the remainder of the chapter tells us how God goes on to create day and night and, and the plants and the sun and the moon and the stars and all kinds of animals. And he creates man, you and I. Male and female, in his own image. So according to the Bible, the, the answer to the question, who is in control of creation, the answer is very clear. God is in control because he is the creator. God was there before the beginning of everything. He is not bound by time. He existed before he created the universe. If God did not exist before the universe, then either the universe was always there, making the universe equal to God in terms of being eternal. If God didn't create it, and if it was always there, well, if God is eternal, then the universe is also eternal, and God is not really above the universe. It's like... The universe is just as magnificent as God in terms of the attribute of eternity. 
Or God was also created, making him equal to the universe, which will do what? Well, that takes away his role as the creator who always existed without the bounds of time. Now, either one of those options does not line up with scripture, does not line up with the biblical story that in the beginning, God created everything. Either one of those options means that God cannot truly be in control of creation. When we say that God created everything, we mean that God the Father took a leading role in creation. But God the Son and God the Holy Spirit were also involved in creation. So the second verse of Genesis 1, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The Holy Spirit was there already at that time of creation, hovering over the face of the waters. And speaking of Jesus, we, we turn to the New Testament in the book of Colossians. Chapter 1, verses 15 to 16. It says this of him. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. Jesus created the universe. The universe was created through him, and the universe was created for him. We can believe what the Bible says about God being the creator because creation itself shows us that there is an intelligent designer there is an intelligent being that has put it all together. When you study creation, when you consider how amazing creation is, you realize that only a very powerful, very intelligent being could have thought about the universe, created it, and then caused it to hold together the way that it does. The universe shows what is commonly called these days intelligent design. When you see a beautiful house, you don't think to yourself, man, that house just kind of, that just appeared randomly. You think, man, that house, there was someone who put the plans together. There must have been an architect who had a vision in his mind. There must have been a family who thought, this is the kind of house we would like to have. And then they went to a trained mind, an architect, who drew those plans, put them together, and then a contractor was brought in, and the building was put together, and it took shape. You realize that there was an intelligent designer behind that house. It's the very same thing with creation. When we look at how amazing creation is, at how it all holds together, it points to an amazing, awesome, incredible God who must have created it. And this is what the Bible tells us. Isaiah 48, 13. My hand laid the foundation of the earth. And my right hand spread out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand forth together. Psalm 19 verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. One of my favorites. Psalm 139 verse 14. I praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Whether we look at 
the amazing trees and the ocean and the grass and the plants and the animals. Or we look at you and I, created in the image of God. It points very clearly to a God who designed with an intelligence that is way above anything that we could ever have. In his grace, he gets, to, he gets us to share that with him because we are created in his image. Isaac Newton, one of the greatest scientists that ever lived, he said this, this most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. I'm not a scientist. I've heard people talk about DNA. DNA is it's found in our bodies. It, it contains the instructions that an organism needs to develop and to live and produce. And these instructions are found inside every cell and they're passed on from parents to their children. Listen to what Bill Gates had to say about DNA. Bill Gates said, DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. This is the software guru of the world saying, listen, DNA, I couldn't even come close. There is a creator. There is a God who created you and I. We are not here just by chance. God himself put us together. He is mighty, more intelligent than we could ever imagine. His name is God. He is the creator of the universe. He is the creator of you and I. So that's God created the universe. That's fine. Our second heading is God controls it. God controls the universe. We can agree to him creating it. But surely he's not interested in it anymore. I mean, look at the brokenness. Look at the sin. Look at the pain. Look at the ugliness that is in the universe. He must have created it and then decided he's going on holiday. No. Even with all the trouble in the universe today, even with all the rebellion of us humans today, God is still in control. I love Isaiah 46. We'll read verses 8 to 10. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Even after humanity fell, even after God's chosen people, the Israelites, would go after other gods, even after they were carried off into captivity because they had decided that they wanted to pursue idols repeatedly and he had warned them and come to them. And even with all that, God says, I am still God and there is none like me and my purpose shall stand. After God created the man and the woman, our first parents, Adam and Eve, in his image, he put them in the Garden of Eden and told them to be fruitful and multiply. He also told them not to eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if they did, they would die. Now because Adam and Eve were created in God's image, which means they had free will. They could exercise their will whether to obey or not obey. God did not create robots. So even as much as we're saying God is ultimately in control, man's free will 
does matter. If you decided this morning to go and stand in the middle of the road and test whether or not you'll get hit by a car, you've exercised your free will for an early arrival in heaven. It, it does matter. The serpent deceived them into eating that forbidden fruit. And it was following that disobedience, that brokenness, pain, death entered the world. We live in a fallen world. And the biggest consequence of being in this fallen world is that our relationship with God has been broken by these actions of our first parents. The great news is that God sent His Son, Jesus, who was with Him before creation. And why was He there before creation? Well, because He's fully God. The fullness of God dwells in Christ. He sent His Son, Jesus, to die for us. And in Jesus dying for you and I, we are redeemed from the punishment that was meant for us. The punishment that was meant for our disobedience, Jesus takes. He becomes a substitute. He stands in our place. He goes to the cross as a perfect sacrifice to pay for the punishment that a just God had to carry out on us as His people. That's the good news. And all that happens because the creator of the universe, who holds it all together, looks at man, looks at you and I and says, I love you. I know your name. I know your history. I know where you're going. I love you. Romans 5 verse 15 summarizes it so well. For if many died through one man's trespass, Adam, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. We died through Adam, but by grace, the free gift that we do not deserve that comes through Jesus Christ, many can have life. Many can be reconciled to God. Many become God's children and have, can know that heaven will be their home one day. Why? Because we earned it? Because we fixed things? No, because of grace. Because of love. Jesus not only restores our relationship with God because He Himself is God, and only God could restore that relationship, but Jesus also holds all things together. He holds the whole universe together. I mean, that is, that is mind-boggling at the least. Colossians 1.17, if we go back to, to that chapter, it goes on to say, and He is before all things. Crea he existed before creation. And in Him, all things hold together. Now you might say, man, there's an area of my life that is absolutely falling apart right now. My work situation, that's absolutely falling apart. My marriage is in trouble. My children are in a bad place. My finances are in absolute chaos. My health is such a cause for concern. I don't know what's going to happen with the future. My extended family, I, it's strife and strife. And it's all these different areas of your life. And you could say, are you seriously telling me that somehow Jesus is sovereign over all that? Well, if we believe the Bible, the answer has to be yes. That in all these things, Jesus is not surprised. In all these things... Jesus is ultimately in control. And that's why Paul could, could, could write to the Romans and say, God works together all things, all things, for the good of those who, who love Him and are called according to His purposes. 
Because in all these things that you and I are facing, Jesus remains Lord. Jesus remains sovereign. Amen. And that is good news. The writer of Hebrews, he says, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom all he created the world, through whom, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And theologian Wayne Grudem tells us that that word uphold has a sense of active, purposeful control over the things being carried from one place to another. Jesus is in control, dear friends. Take heart. And one day God will restore all of creation to a perfect state. The brokenness that entered this world with our first parents, we will know no more. He will wipe away every tear. There will be no more weeping, no more sorrow. Man, even these bodies that are wasting away day by day will get new ones. Until then, we, we live with this tension that Jesus, you are in control. You are holding all things together. But Jesus, at the same time, we, we, we remember your words when you said, in this world you will face trouble because we live in a broken world. And, 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 and we're pulled in both directions. But we mustn't be pulled to a place where we despair because the greater truth is that Jesus is holding it all together and his kingdom is coming and it will fully come and he will restore all things in his time. Praise be to God. So we've seen, firstly, that God created the universe. We've seen that God controls the universe and, 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 and Jesus Christ is at the very center of the control that God has over this universe. Man, that, that, that God-man, the God who became flesh, who walked on this earth, who wept, who took on the greatest weakness we could ever imagine by allowing himself to be crucified on the cross for us, he upholds it all. Our final question for this morning, our, our last heading is this issue of evolution. And why is it important to think about evolution? Well, it's important to think about evolution because evolution stands today as the main opposing view. That's, that's interesting, isn't it? That, that we started, yeah. Evolution stands today as the main opposing view to creation. Evolution says, in the case of, of humans, that we evolved over time from, from ape-like beings into man. Now, those who know better about evolution, they will say that actually, whatever we share with apes does not suggest that we come from apes. It suggests that the intelligent designer used the same raw materials to create apes as he used to create humans. So some of the raw materials that God used to create apes, he also used to create humans. Does that mean we descended from apes? No. 
evolution is this process by which living things develop. They evolve over time from some earlier form into something else. And the father of modern evolutionary theory is, is Charles Darwin. And he argued that life began when a mix of chemicals on the earth spontaneously produced a simple one-celled life form. The theory in, in, in its most simplistic form is something along those lines. And over time, there have been mutations of these cells leading to different living things. Now, from a biblical standpoint, we must reject evolution because God says he created us. God did not say there was some chemical on the earth and spontaneously it began to change over millions of years until man came. No, the Bible says God created man in his image. We must reject this as a false teaching, as something that is completely untrue because it does not line up with the scriptures. Now, evolution is taught in schools, which is really unfortunate. Over the years, the scientific evidence, not biblical evidence, scientific evidence against evolution has been growing. So here are a few arguments against evolution from science. Firstly, experiments with animals and plants have yielded very little in terms of new types of trees or animals. In other words, trying to breed, trying to mimic this evolutionary process that created these different types of creatures. Man, dogs are still dogs. The scientific evidence to say, hey, where, where are those changes? It's not there. Secondly, there is no convincing evidence from archaeology of living creatures gradually evolving from one form to another. Now, why is this important? Because a lot of the evolutionary discussion has to do with, well, this is what a creature looked like. So if we can go to archaeology and archaeology can help us find a fossil that looked like that, and then we have a fossil that shows the next stage, and the next stage, and the next stage, until we get to that, then it confirms evolution. Now those who've done the, the hard work on this will tell you that the archaeologic, archaeological evidence for this just simply isn't there. The convincing evidence for it is just not there. And then probably the most challenging, damning argument against evolution is that spontaneously creating life by mixing chemicals, as the theory suggests life began, that has yet to be achieved in any of the world's top laboratories to date. Because only... God, only a creator, could create life. And the efforts to try and mimic that process and say, hey, okay, let's, let's try and see if we could, we could randomly come up with a process that will create life, it hasn't happened. To teach evolution is unfortunate. And we are seeing more and more that it is a scientifically weak theory. Although some of the scientific world want to teach it as a fact. If we teach evolution, hopefully we can also teach alongside it creation. And allow those who are listening to make an informed decision for themselves. From a biblical standpoint, if evolution is all we have, then what is our purpose? If all we are is 
creatures that have evolved and are still evolving. I mean, I'm not done yet. On that trajectory, you and I, I wonder whether the next thing is good. we're going to kind of bend over. But I don't know what will happen. But if, 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 if this is all we have is that we are creatures that are still in the process of evolving, what, what's our purpose? We're just a random experiment in motion. Where, where is God in the equation? Where, where is a creator that we can relate to? Why are we on this earth? How do we answer those questions if evolution is all that we have? No, the Bible says that we are created in his image. You see, if evolution is all that we have, there is no reason to be answerable to a higher moral authority. We can do whatever we want. There's no reason to say there is an absolute lawgiver. There is an absolute authority. There is a creator that we are all answerable to. And we have fallen away from him. And in his mercy and in his grace, he has chosen to pursue us and restore us to him through the finished work on the cross of his son. There's no reason for that. Anne Coulter, she said, I would like evolution to join the roster of other discredited religions. I would agree with her. I hope that evolution will soon die. And that the truth of God's word, God who created us, God who created the heavens and the earth, that that truth will stand firm. Because when we answer the question, who is in control? This theory stands right up against the answer of scripture, which says, that God is in control. Dear friends, we've seen that God is the creator. God is holding it all together. We've seen that there are theories, there are views out there. This one being the, the primary one that would stand against the truth of God being that creator. Now, if God is the one who is really in control of all creation, if God is the one who's really in control of the whole universe, how then are we to live? What is our rightful response? We should trust Him. Yeah, it's like, man, it's, it's not that complicated. Pretty obvious, eh? We should follow him. But here's the thing. You can be a Christian, but live as though you are the one who's really in control. Of course, our choices matter, and we must plan, and we must exercise sound judgment and wisdom. But we can be Christians who live as though, actually, I am the one who is really ruling and reigning over my life. What will be the signs that you live as though you are really in control? You say God is in control, but your life, my life, suggests otherwise. Here are a couple of signs. Firstly, you will have difficulty with obedience to the Word of God. If you think that you are the one that's really in control, when God's Word says A, you'll be like, hmm, nah, I'll do my own thing. When God calls you to obey Him in an area of your life, with your family, 
in, in, your, in your job, in your sex life, whatever the case might be. It's, God, God says, this is, this is my word. I'm in control. Uh, you know, are you really in control, God? Because I, I think I've got this area covered. Thanks. Difficulty with obedience to the word of God. Here's another sign. Major disappointment or anger when things don't go your way. You'll be so devastated or so angry because things didn't go your way. Why? Well, didn't you realize I'm the one that's really in control of, of traffic in Dar? I mean, how dare these policemen think that they can run my life? I mean, Tanesco, doesn't Tanesco know that my sleep is like what the whole planet revolves around and when the power goes, the fans go, the AC goes, they just throw my life into an absolute fit. I'm in control. Or you made plans, the plans don't go as they should go, and you are so devastated. You're so distraught. I mean, it's, I mean disappointment, it, it comes in life, doesn't it? You just have to read David in the Psalms to see that, man, even some of Paul's words, we, we get disappointed. We get discouraged. But, but they, they sets in a pattern and, and a way of life where, where when things don't go your way, it's, it's like the end of the world. Why? Well, because the world revolves around you. And, and I can identify with this. I've seen it in my own life. And I'm saying, God, help me. Because you are the one who's in control, not me. Yes, I'll plan and I'll, I'll exercise my free will. I'll do my best. But Lord, help me to realize that ultimately you are in control. Here's another sign, the last one. Worry and stress. You look to the future and you're like, oh, you're so worried. You look at your kids and, man, you're so stressed. Everywhere you look, it's just a source of worry and stress and strain because you look at your, your education. You're, you're distraught because at the end of the day, God doesn't really work together all things for my good. At the end of the day, God's purpose, which is way better than anything I could imagine, that's not really what's going to come to pass. It's my purpose that's going to come to pass. So I need to stress and worry and be absolutely distraught by all these things. So we can be Christians, we can be followers of Jesus, but live as though at the end of the day, I am the one who is in control. Now, will there be times when worry and stress come? Absolutely. That's why Jesus had to say, don't worry. And then say it again, don't worry. Will disappointment come? Absolutely. Will we get angry? Absolutely. Will we struggle with those times? Will there be tensions when, when the word of God comes so alive in an area of our life and we, we have to submit ourselves to that will? Absolutely. But what's the bent of our hearts? Is the bent of our hearts to hold on and grab and try to be the one who runs it all? Or is the bent of our hearts to run to the creator of the universe and say, Lord, I need you. We need to repent. We need to change how we think about ourselves. And then we need to change how we live in relation to God. And allow him to truly be on the throne of our lives. 
If you are not a Christian here this morning, and our assumption at God's tribe is that we will have non-Christians as part of our community exploring the claims of Christ, and one day coming to Christ and saying, Lord, I, I surrender my life to you. If you are not a Christian here this morning, you need to change how you relate to Jesus. Because Jesus created the universe. Jesus holds it all together. It holds together in him. And you need to realize that Jesus is God. And with all that power that he has as God, he died for you. He died for me. He died for our sins. So that our sins can be forgiven. So that we can have new life. So that we can have eternal life. So that the, the, the choices that our first parents made in that beautiful garden. That the impact, the brokenness that came with that would be removed. And we can be restored to God. And that happens through Jesus Christ. So if you haven't yet come to Christ as your Lord and Savior, you must do that. Surrender to Him and say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I put my faith in you.